Hey, BK, welcome to the podcast. Welcome. How you doing? Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. This is awesome. Man. Beautiful. It's been a while. We've been trying for a long time. Very true. It, it has been a while. And I've got to let people know you're one of the people that inspired me to do podcasting from um, the interviews that you do on the men's prayer line and um, the, the role that you have as a moderator, being able to not only um, moderate the conversation, but to articulate your thought in a way where it, it leaves it open to other people mm -hmm. that are listening to really chime in or just to even at times when you can't chime in or you're, you're not sure if you want to chime in it gives you something to think about to be like oh okay like i've got a i've got some meat to chew on and then there's this there's this bone where it's like there's a there's enough being said here that it might take me months to maybe process this and right. just right. kind of um just just to um like like we were talking about is no matter what you're doing or where you're at you've got to be able to process that and and not dwell on it as okay am, am i succeeding is this a failure wow. am i in the now or am i looking at tomorrow like where am i trying to go sometimes you just got to be where you're at and right, ten toes down. Right, yeah, ten yeah. toes down. Absolutely, because there's good and bad in all of it. Mm -hmm. There's a beautiful part of what I'm going through and an ugly part of what I'm going through. There's a part about what I'm experiencing right now that I love, and then there's another part of it that I hate. And if I get stuck on either side, if I'm not very careful, then it'll cause me to look at my my current situation in the wrong way. So the example I might use is this: um, you got to have core values and you got to have core vices. So the core values, Asher, are what I stand for. These are my core beliefs. These are my principles. It's not about my feelings. It's not about my emotions. These are arbitrary. I shouldn't say arbitrary. These are unique things, right, outside of who I am that I say I stand for. That's cool. I think a lot of people have that. But what we don't always have, we're not always clear on, are the core vices. These are the things that I'm susceptible to. So my core values are what I stand for. But my core vices are what I am willing to, or I could potentially fall for. So, for example, drug addiction runs, womanizing runs in my bloodline. My father did it. My grandfather did it. And so I am susceptible to alcohol use. I'm susceptible to becoming addicted to drugs. So for me personally, I don't, I don't drink socially. I've never been high or drunk in my life, not because I'm some goody two shoes. That's not what it is. It's because I saw it in my father and I realized that I either have the gene, the generational curse. I'm not sure what we want to call it, but I am easily susceptible to doing certain things. Right. And, and it could even be habits. It could be behaviors. Maybe we were talking earlier off camera about how there's certain little tricks to getting editing done. And if I don't do those things, so for example, I, I make sure I do certain things and make sure that editing process is seamless because I don't want to, that's just not fun for me. I don't want to spend all day editing, right? Um, I'm a guy who likes to keep a clean house. That gives me clarity. Why? Why do I like a clean house? I like cleaning up things, not because I like to clean, but because sometimes in what I'm doing, especially when you talk about moderating a call, you talk about work, working with men, you're talking about coaching people is like, how do I determine if I'm making headway? How do I determine if I've gotten from point A to point B? How do I know that I'm actually moving forward? And sometimes when I clean something, I, I can see that it was dirty. Now it's clean. This may sound weird. I had a carpet cleaning business for 10 years. And what was beautiful about it, this may sound so odd to some people, is that when I was cleaning carpet, I loved, I loved interacting with the customer. I always, obviously love getting paid. I love to be the entrepreneur. I love taking care of my family. But what really gave me a sense of peace was every day I'm cleaning that carpet and I can tell one side of the carpet is dirty and the other side of the carpet is clean. And as I'm going from one side to the other, there was no ambiguity as to whether or not I was doing a good job. There was no ambiguity as to whether or not I had accomplished something. And it reminds me of 
when God said, let there be, and then at the end of the day, he would say, and it was good. And I feel like I gotta have that. So I gotta have my core values, what I stand for. I gotta have my core vices, what I fall for. But I also have to have a sense of accomplishment every single day, every single day. Do you ever feel like needing that sense of accomplishment every day, does that ever become like a, an obsession? It can be, right? Because you can chase the prize, right? You mm -hmm. can chase the prize. And sometimes that feeling, that dopamine, that oxytocin, that serotonin, those endorphins, I call it dose. You can become a dope fiend. <laughs> you can become a dope fiend and you're chasing the high. You're chasing the affirmations of men. But I, but I do want to make a distinction. There are external goals. There are external things that we got to figure this out. There are things that, that other people say are amazing. That's affirmation. But then there's some things on the inside of me that, that set off the dopamine, and that's confirmation. And I got to be very careful. If I'm chasing a feeling that comes from the outside, I have no control. And in fact, I'm giving over my control to whatever that thing is. But if I'm making sure I know who I am, my core values, if I know what really makes me tick, if I know my purpose, my gift, and my call, if I know why I'm here, who I am, and what I'm supposed to be doing, and that's the, those are the three questions of life. And I'm trying to figure it out every day. I'm tinkering with that every single day. What am I? Who am I? And why am I here? If I can figure those things out, then I can cease and desist, if you will, from worrying about what other people say. And don't get me wrong, I'm not 100% there. But as I get older, I stop worrying about other people's opinion. And now the only person that I'm concerned about pleasing is me, is my mm -hmm. wife, is, is my father. And so those challenges, but it's growth, though. That's maturity. Mm -hmm. That's maturity. And so a free man, a free person, a free individual is the individual who can be unlocked or untethered from the opinions of men. Mm -hmm. That's freedom. That's freedom. I love, I love that explanation. And <laughs> as a follow up to that, a question I always love to ask every guest is, who do you say you are as a way to mm -hmm. take what you just defined as freedom and and mm. who you are and maybe how you've gone on this journey to seek that out for yourself? That's good. No, that's a great question. Who do I say I am? I first will answer your question by saying there's a gap between who I say I am and who I actually am. There's a gap. And every day I'm trying to close that gap, right? Because I realize that there's a person that I present myself to the world. And I've done that for years. And I think this is human nature. You present yourself, if you feel weak, you present yourself as strong. If you feel dumb, you present yourself as smart. If you feel uncomfortable, you try to present yourself as being someone who has authority. And those are lies. But those are the lies that we tell in order to cope. And sometimes you have to look strong in the face of adversity. But over time, you can't keep on putting on this superhero cape. Sometimes at some point. So who, I guess your question to me is, who am I? Am I really Superman or am I really Clark Kent? The beautiful part is I'm both. I am who I say I am, but I'm also not who I say I am. And the gap is where I don't want to lose myself. The gap is the world. The gap is what I get up every day and try to figure out. So I can say to you that I'm a speaker, mentor, coach, and I might be a prophet. I can say those things to you, but I got to get up every day and reach for those things. And even though those are titles that I I might be able to answer to, is that who I really am? Because another part of me is just a little boy, just a little boy who remembers his father leaving at five years old and then coming back at 10 years old. And then that same father leaving at 17. So I would say uh, gone at five, came back at 10, at 17, gone again, you know, bars, right? Mm -hmm. I would say that, but then I realize I'm a 49-year-old man soon to be who still craves the affirmation of his father. So in a lot of ways, I'm still that five-year-old little boy, but I'm also the 49-year-old man standing in front of you. And I realize that though my father abandoned us, abandoned me, he also came back. And so while he's a father that hurt me, he's also the father that gave me the best he had. And so until I became a father, oh, you got to hear what I'm saying? Until I became a daddy, I didn't mm -hmm. understand the second part as right. much as I understood the first part. So I understood the pain, but I didn't understand the reasons for the abandonment. He wasn't running away from me. He was running to try to find himself. 
Mm-hmm. And until I was put into that position to have to chase after who I am, right? This, that's your question. Who do I say I am? I don't know who I am because I'm trying to find that person. I know who I'm not. Mm-hmm. I know who I'm not. I know who I present myself to be. I know the lies I tell myself and other people, but who I am is a question I'm trying to figure out every single day. And I know there's a huge gap, a huge gap between who I say I am and who I actually am. And every day, if I can close that gap, I'm better and better. And it comes to that point where I just realize that there's a gap and it's okay. Yeah. Man, that was liberating, liberating. That, that's awesome. And one point that you made that I feel is, it's really relevant to, I guess, how would you say, present conversation. And especially when you talk about from a, a male perspective where it's very, um, it's very defining when you you look at what a man is supposed to be or or what you're told as a little boy growing up and then you find yourself in adulthood and you're kind of maybe if i'm speaking from my perspective and it's trying to make sense of who it is that you are who it is that you're going to be whether it's um success from a social perspective to where Mm -hmm. you're you're financially able to provide for yourself and maybe a family in the future mm-hmm. or you're um physically a- attractive or you're um spiritually gifted or in tune or now like a big things like emotional intelligence or just like having the big five what whatever it is that that's like the the catchphrase it's like part of you being who you are as a man, it's kind of defined by what the environment around you says. But yeah. the, the more yeah. you get to know who you are yourself and you get to look inwards and you not only look at yourself to where it's like, okay, this, this is what works for me, but yeah. you start to address like the little boy that was either not validated or affirmed by his dad because that's what a lot of a lot of uh men go through a lot of boys go through is that that relationship between their dads whether they had it or they didn't have it and it's very pronounced when you don't have something and you're you're constantly trying to fill the void with this or that right and Right. until that's made clear to you and, and some people have the opportunity to, to speak with their fathers and others may not but being able to have like you said have that clarity of perspective where you can say okay it wasn't necessarily that he didn't have time for me or he didn't he it's it's like um it, things aren't always what what they appear and and the more you can gain a different perspective on what's going on or you give someone like your father or your parent or like a coach someone that you look up to the more you can kind of give them a benefit of the doubt not to be grace. like i'm grace. gonna i'm right grace i'm not just gonna hold this thing over your head like the right. freer you become and I, it's, it's yeah. the two if you don't mind me saying it's the right. both like I hold him uh, because the pain is real. Mm. The hurt is real. The wound is real. Mm -hmm. But in the same breath, the ability for him to give given me the best he had is also real. Mm -hmm. And so it's that duality. How do I handle, how do I acknowledge the the humanity of who he was, but also acknowledge the fact that there's a pain in me because I think going either way is wrong. So sometimes we get to the point where we just want to hug and sing kumbaya and not acknowledge the fact that you were bleeding. Mm. You were bleeding. Someone shot you in the chest, right? Being metaphorically speaking, someone mm. shot you in the chest and conveyed to you, okay, well, you should get over it. Well, yes, I have forgiven that person. Mm. I forgave them, but I still have to deal with the triage. I still have got to deal with the fact, I gotta go, I gotta have some surgery. I gotta go through rehab. I'm gonna have a scar on my chest, no matter what. Every time I wake up in the morning and it rains, my chest hurts. The mm-hmm. pain and the residue of what you went through is still there. 
And so to not be able to have the ability to express both, right? The thankfulness that he gave me the best that he had, but also to honestly, honestly own the fact that there is a pain there and a hurt there. I think we do ourselves a disservice. It's not one or the other, it's both. And that duality is strange. Mm -hmm. You're the best thing and the worst thing that happened to me. I love you and I hate you, but I can't stay in either side too long. If I stay on the I love you side and I don't acknowledge what you did, then I give you a pass. And I ignore my own humanity in the name of trying to acknowledge yours. But if I don't honor, if I stay or if I dwell too long in the hurtful thing, then I won't acknowledge the fact that there, are, there is goodness in you. There is goodness in the person that hurt me. If I'm not careful, I got to have a balance between the two. Sometimes there'll be good days and some days, sometimes there's bad days. Right. Sometimes you wake up and you're comfortable with all that you went through. And some days you wake up and you're uncomfortable. Well, take that and use that for your for your glory or God's glory and your authority that day. So my ability to identify with the little boy who feels insignificant, my, my ability to deal with or understand a, a young man who does have his father in his life now works for me. We were both on a call earlier today and I was dealing with four to five different women who were trying to advocate for their sons because their fathers are not in their lives. I have an empathy and a heart for that mother I have a heart for that son because I was that son at one point. But if I focus on, okay, my dad is back. They've been married soon to be 50 years, which is 100% true. If mm -hmm. I don't acknowledge that hurtful time as well, I think I'm also being dishonest. So to stay on mm -hmm. either side too long is to me a lie, right. if I can be clear. Yeah. I, I, and I think that's a great point that you bring up that you've got to be honest to both sides be grateful oh, yeah. for what was given to you but not not to dwell on like acknowledge but not to dwell on what was done because it right. it's like that um i don't know if it's fool me fool me once shame on you uh -oh. fool me uh -oh. twice you sound like you sound like george w bush <laughs> right <laughs> fool me once shame on you fool me twice shame on me right, right. shame on me absolutely right mm -hmm. Because I, I, I guess it, in a way, it's like you you leave yourself open to be manipulated if you mm -hmm. if you kind of you you want to forgive and forget, but you mm -hmm. don't want to be in a state of manipulation where someone they they say sorry for what was done, and you're like, okay, yes, I I acknowledge the sorry, and I'm not stuck on that anymore. Like, yes, we can move on, but. We're not going to go back in time and just make things like we're not going to rewrite the past and just make it right. like it, it didn't happen. It's like we may not have done what would have been, quote unquote, ideal. It might look right. great in other people's and what eyes. What is that? Right. Yeah, and what is that? By the what, way? What I is mean, for, for some people, it's it's again what's painted in a way where it's OK. I was at problem. your at your sports games or mm -hmm. we did this mm -hmm. or even in a sense to where for me it's in like for me going through like high school middle school college it's it's for some people they have that um support system where it's like okay you can have open conversations with your parents you can almost talk about everything mm -hmm. but then it's like on the other hand if you're just kind of left to your own devices you're allowed to go out and and explore go discover it's like on the one hand you can be brought up in a strict environment mm -hmm. like i was where it's like um preacher's kid um <laughs> you don't watch tv during the week like you're encouraged to wow. study all the time it's like for a long time i was so focused on that that i almost forget i would like I would choose to forget that, oh, like once I leave the house and I go to school, education is being pushed. But like that education being pushed, like my parent isn't behind me at school saying, OK, you need to be here. Like, yes, you need to make these grades, but they're not saying you need to study this. Like you need to study this to get into this school. You need to do that. Like maybe it, it might have done something if they were on top of me at all times. But it's like it's my responsibility at the end of the day to say, okay, 
I choose to go into engineering because I'm around this environment. I get to explore something right. and it's like, hey, decision time. Do you want to do like technical courses? Which one do you want? And I, I made a choice. I found something that was good. Maybe it was like happy luck where you, you take a class. It's like, oh, this seems fun. Like you get to mess around on the computer. You, you design something by hand and it's a, a, a lot of that helped me be where I'm at. So I, I can't be completely upset with you didn't show me all these things to do right. because now I find myself in an environment where I see this person says, oh, like I'm an engineer because my parent was an engineer. I'm a yeah. lawyer because my parent was a lawyer. I work in the family business. I've always built this. It's like, okay, I can sit there and, like I did for a while and just continue to dwell in, oh, well, my dad's a pastor, but I made it very clear in my head. I, I didn't want to become a pastor. So it's like, if I, if I really wanted to go... I, I, got a, I, got a, I, got a, I got a perspective on that. To mm -hmm. me, at the core of what an apostle does, your father is an apostle, mm -hmm. right? That means foundational. He builds things. Right. What does his son do? His son's an engineer. He builds things. Right. It's not, it's not different. You're right. still operating in the same bloodline. He, he builds in the spirit realm, souls. Mm -hmm. You build in the natural realm. It's but, not different. Right, right. But, uh, but I mean, it, it's... I guess what what I was getting at is that yeah. in growing and maturing, in some regard, part of me um, came to terms or is coming to terms with this is what I I thought I didn't get, but this yeah. is really what I got as a result of it. And here's Absolutely. here's what I can see as a positive, but I love it. I'm not going to go into like a okay, if we didn't talk normally, like if we don't have a conversation like once a week where I can just check on you and say, hey, how are you doing? How is this? Like, what's something you're looking forward to this week? Like if, if we can't have that, it, it's like you, you're not just going to skip 10 years, 20 years, and then all of a sudden want to have like, a random exchange where you say something and I'm just supposed to like know exactly what you're thinking. It's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly trying to understand people on a regular basis without trying to complicate stuff. Like I don't have um, telepathy, but it's like, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm leaving the door open enough to say, okay, if, if we want to communicate, there's there's room to communicate but it's like we can't communicate um on a level to where it's always looking at the past or it's always um from a perspective of woe is me it's like that mm -hmm. that's not gonna help like you're if, referring to you're referring to speaking with your father or your parents right maybe. right right okay we're, we're speaking well, right. I have an idea about that because mm -hmm. I think what we do is we're so quick to try to fill the void with something, mm -hmm. right? And the, the void can be filled with success or it can be filled with a vice. Sometimes we call it an addiction. Mm -hmm. But all, all that is is a person trying to fulfill a natural desire mm -hmm. um, unnaturally. That's right. it. They're trying to feel something that... But here's the thing. Can we become at some point comfortable with the void? That's a good question. I don't... Uh, I don't so. So the void is there to make me wanton for something, right? The void is there to make me dig deeper. And so are we are we chasing fulfillment? I know the answer is yes, but are we are we looking to be whole before it's time to be whole? Am I trying to graduate from senior high school? And I'm only in the second grade. I know it can happen, right? You may be a person who's a part of Mensa or something like that. But, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, overwhelmingly, generally speaking, that doesn't happen. It takes mm -hmm. you 20 years to be 20 years old. And even so, even if they're brilliant, even if they're geniuses and they can be in college, you know, we remember Doogie Howser, right? Mm -hmm. If they can be in college as a young person, it's still, they still have to develop. Nothing can, nothing can cause you to develop socially. There's no hack to that. Right. You might be intellectually ready to go to college as a young, very, very young person, but you cannot do it socially. 
or maturely or experience wise. And so I wonder, are we trying to fill a void and not be comfortable with the void itself? Because the void is where you learn. That's where you grow. Maybe it's okay to be the gap, right? We talked about the gap between who you are and who you say you are. Maybe I need to spend some time in that gap long enough to humble me, long enough to realize that the gap is actually not something that's bad, but the gap is something that's good. And we all have a gap. We're just lying about it. Right. We all well, have a challenge. I don't know. You don't know. Right. I haven't but I figured mean, it out. You haven't figured it out. Right. I, I think when you, when you ask that question, it's um, are we trying to fill the gap? I feel that my my short answer would be yes, because when you become aware that there is a gap, you're like, why is the gap here? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> where did the gap come from? It's like it it doesn't it doesn't feel natural because it's almost like it's throwing off the flow of things. And one, it could- According to whom though? Again, according, either according to the surrounding or according to what- Society. Well, I, I wanna say right. society, but at the same time, I also wanna say like what's become comfortable to a point because it, it's like at, okay. at times maybe it's like, you're born you don't know anything about the world and you, maybe you learn as you go like you wake up like you're screaming you're crying you don't know what's this or what's that and like as you progress slightly it feels like okay I've got a grasp on this okay now I've got a grasp on this okay now I've got a it's like you're you're leveling up and then when you get to a certain level, you're like fifth grade. Okay. Oh, I'm going to go into middle school. Uh, I'm going to be. That's what happens. Right. That's what it's happens. like that, that uncertainty. And then mm -hmm. like you go mm -hmm. from there to like, okay, going through middle school, going through middle school, right. eighth grade or ninth grade, going Crazy. into high school. And it's right. like, there's another shift. Right. Yep. Absolutely. And then right. you, you go through that. High school. I'm glad you brought up those times because I have college. children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got children that went through those ages. And I remember this. I'll tell you the story about a daughter who I gave. We gave her her first cell phone the summer before she went to middle school. Mm -hmm. It was an older phone, but it was she was excited about it. She loved this phone all summer. She was all over it. But mm -hmm. the second day of school, she never took the phone back to school again. Mm -hmm. She went to school and she saw everyone else's phone. And all of a sudden, her phone wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, what she had wasn't good enough. All of a sudden, the thing that made her excited for almost 90 days of the summer, all of a sudden, wasn't. it was embarrassing to her. And I wonder, even though the phone did the same thing, even though the phone brought her the same joy, she got into an environment, culturally speaking, right? Ethnos mm -hmm. ethos, I can tell you about that in just a moment, where she allowed the environment, understandably so, she's a young person, to dictate what was good or bad for her. But until she got into that environment, she was fine. Mm -hmm. And I think we as human beings do the same thing. She, she should have said to herself, and I, I know this is impossible, right, young person. I did the same thing, right? The shoes, the clothes, the haircut. You now have to conform to the environment, right? And I have this little thing I say. I say your ethnos and your ethos are limiting your cosmos. Your ethnos is, these are the people that you're connected to who um, have your same ethnicity, the same blood, the same mm -hmm. family line. You're connected to them by blood and mm -hmm. culture and belief systems and tradition. But then there's the, your ethos. These are the people you're connected to based on thinking, right? Maybe the same political party, maybe the same religious background. And so you have a group of people who are informed, who inform you intellectually. So you're connected by belief system right mm -hmm. and then the another group of people which are your ethnic right your ethos who you're connected to i'm sorry your ethno so you're connected to them by blood and those two people though they give you information about who you are they give mm -hmm. you a sense of unity they let you know where you stand and where you sit in the world this is your tribe unfortunately while they give you affirmation they also limit you and cap you from where you can go in this world because the gift that God has given you is for the e is for the cosmos, which is the world. So your ethnos and your ethos is limiting your cosmos, meaning the people that you love and respect based on blood, the people that you love and respect based on belief, 
they gave you a sense of achievement to a point, but now the very the very people who gave you clarity on who you are are now, now limiting how far you can go and grow. And we got to be super careful about that. Am I a man of color? Yes. Do I live in America? Yes. Am I a Christian? Yes. Am I a husband? Am I a father? Am I a speaker? Am I a mentor? Or am I a coach? Am I a prophet? All of those things are true, but I'm also who I say I am. Meaning I'm not limited to those things. I appreciate those things giving me clarity, but those are still titles. That's not who I am. So I go back to the first question. Who do I say I am? At this point, I say, I don't know. But two years ago, I would have given you a definitive answer. But wisdom has shown me you don't know who you are because it changes every so many years. Who I was at 15 is not who I was at 25. Who I was at 25 is not who I was at 35. Who I was was at 35 is not who I was at 45. And I'm pretty confident when I hit 55, I'm going to be a totally different dude. And I see things very differently. So now... It took me 40 years to get to this place, Asher. I'm at a point now where I embrace the void because the void, we think it means uncertain. We think the void means unknown. We think the void means unclear. We think the void means un, unprepared, but the void also can mean unlimited. It also can mean that this is where you can fill in the blank. It also can be a fill in the blank test is the best test in the world. We don't like them. We don't mm -hmm. like them because you got to think and you got to write, we want, the, we want the multiple choice, but the multiple choice will be right or wrong. But if I can grasp the idea in the short answer, if I can fill in the blank and give you a piece, if I can at least explain to you how I have grasped the information, I can always get partial credit. So the blank and the void is not something to be afraid of. The void is my friend. Yeah. The void is my friend because now I can go into the void even though it's scary, even though it's unknown, even though it's unsure, I can also go into the void and it's unlimited. Mm. Ah, you got to know what I'm saying, bro. It's unlimited. It's unlimited. And I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. So what do we use? What is the symbol in our culture that we use to designate the void or the unknown? What is that? It's the X, right? Yeah. What? Right. So think about this. What do we do in math? We solve for the X. Right, right. So when it comes to an equation, we're not afraid of the X, we embrace it. Mm -hmm. So the void that's in the equation is not something that we fear, but actually the whole purpose of the equation. It's the reason why we, it's, the, it's the star of the party. So perspective, right? right? Perspective. Then if you think about the map, we maybe we don't go to malls anymore, but, but malls do exist. But anytime you go to a place you've never been, usually there's a, a map somewhere and it'll say, um, X marks the spot, but you are here. And mm -hmm. what I learned about a map is that X on that on that spot is sometimes it's a dot, but but that X lets me know where I am because I realize that the map has no power for me, has no it can't inform me if I don't know where I am in relationship to the map. Mm -hmm. If I don't know where I am, so so again, the X marks the spot and gives me clarity on not just where I am, but where I am in terms of where I want to go. Right, so X marks the spot. And then last but not least, the X, that unknown thing is, if you look at an X, especially if you look at the way it's written on a computer, from every direction that X is, is exactly the same thing. Yeah. North, south, east, west, either direction, the X is the same. So instead of this X being this, this unknown, this unsure, this unclear, this unforgiven, this un, 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 all these, un, we need to change our language. The X is for the unlimited. And so now the X can become anything I needed to be. I wasn't given a void to confuse me. I was given an avo a void so that when I get to the point where I know who I am, when I get to the point where I have confidence in what I say and do, I can feel the void according to who I am and how God made me to be. The void is not my enemy. The void is my friend. Come on, baby. <laughs> the void that. is my friend. You know right. what I mean? So it's not, I don't need to avoid the void. Embrace the void. Embrace the fact that, oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really know how to do that. And as soon as I say, I don't know, the creative juices, my creative nature now is activated to come up with a solution to fill the void or to come up with the answer to the I don't know. But if I try to pretend like I have the answers, mm -hmm. if I lie like everybody else is lying, if I try to feel, you asked me a question, you said, who do I say I am? 
I don't know because who I've said I am up to this point was predicated upon the ethnos and the ethos. It was predicated upon what the culture told me. It was predicated upon what a man of color is supposed to do or say in the United States of America. And that is not necessarily who God made me to be. Ah, whoa, bro. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good because um, I guess to kind of tie this in where we where we started the conversation that on yeah. my ride back from work, the question popped up into my head when it's, um, I've heard it asked, it's like, are you afraid of failure or are you afraid of success? They say that mm -hmm. you can have, um, you can have people that are either or, and yeah. I guess sometimes it's, it's, it's easy to time. say that, right. It's both sometimes you, you can say you're afraid of failure because it's like, you don't want to you don't, you don't want to miss the mark, so to speak. Right. But right. a lot of times I, in that moment, I was thinking, I think I, I fear success more at times because I'm, I'm less willing to face it because success is kind of pointing me towards the void where with failure, it's like, if you fail, you, you know what failure looks like, you know, what, um, you're familiar Not, with it. Right. You're, you're familiar with it, whether you're late, whether you're you don't do what you said you were going to do. Um, success in a way. Uh, there's I think there's a big push about redefining success or just being very clear on on what it is and what it's not. And again, good too. in society good. And, and in in the culture where we're at, because yeah a lot of people that have become the quote unquote successful when it's monetary mm -hmm. stature, it's, I guess in, in a way it's like those things aren't arbitrary and, and it's like the story is like again and again and again and again, it's right. said the same right. way. And a lot of yeah. times it's like people that have seen people that have reached a certain stature they'll tell you time and time that it's not that stature that's going to make you it's not how you how much you make that's going to make you but it's it's um who is the type of person you are and depending on, on what you're chasing what you're trying to reach like if you're someone that has means or has um yeah i'll, I'll say has means or has money if you're someone that has the money and you're telling to someone that doesn't have the money, it's like, you don't want to be in my position. It's hard as the person, <laughs> right? It's right. hard as the person that's try. like, yeah, it's let like, me yeah, try first. let me, Let's let me try and see how that works out. <laughs> right. And, right. And usually I, yeah. something I, I heard recently, someone's like, you know, yes, I want you to try. But when you say, let me try, it doesn't mean I'm going to let you try with what I have, because it's like, I've gotten to this point here, but it's like, if you wish to go through everything that you have to go through to get to this, um, to this space, however it's glorified, however it's, it's seen, it's like, go through it at your own peril. But remember you, you were warned. And it's right. like, usually when, when people hear that, it, it sounds, it kind of sounds like a backhanded advice or a backhanded suggestion to be like, okay, yeah, it's easy for you to say. It's like, you're, you're not in my position. And it, it, it seems like it's no matter where someone's at, you're never going to be in someone's position because like, like time, time and time again, it's like, whoever gets to that level, we, we were talking about George Bush earlier, and I was thinking of J. Cole, like quoting the George Bush thing. And I think I'd heard him say it in his more, in a more recent song where it's like, when he started his, his um, career in hip hop and rap, he was going a certain trajectory. Mm -hmm. And it was about clout, it was about, um, getting the money it was about getting 
notoriety is about getting certain things but at some point his perspective changed right. and the more at least from the outside it appears the more he went into his void or went into um yes the more he kind like of that. went into like what he saw and kind of looking at the optics and being like okay this doesn't look like that maybe right. i'm not going to dress the part i'm going right. to let That's my hair grow out. I'm going to get the locks. I'm going to, I'm going to do what I want to do. Like now right. he's authentically, right, right. He's, he's authentically pursuing right. himself. The more he's doing that, he's receiving more appreciation and more, more of this. Absolutely. And it's like right. from at least. See, that's so right. powerful. But it, it was, it, it was go ahead, sorry. No, no, no. I, I was just going to say it. It's one of those things where it's, if you don't, you really got to pay attention to what you're paying attention to, because it's yes. like, it's very easy to look at people's lives, especially public figures from the outside mm -hmm. and just be mm -hmm. like, well, this person's right. And this person's wrong. This is good and bad, but it's yeah. like the gray in between again, that void. It's like, eh, like let, let's not talk about that. It's either right or wrong. Like, <laughs> there's there's nothing there to discuss because it's like many people know when you start to have nuanced conversations or personal interrogations into that personal like that stuff that's not one way or another it's like right. well okay i can i can see why you would do this or i, I wouldn't mm -hmm. fault you for being a child at a child's age it's like, oh, well, if social media was around when, when I was younger, it's oh, like, wow. right. I'd be in all right. kinds of trouble. It's like, okay, when, you, know when you have honest conversations about what's really, um, what people's intentions are or what um, what's possible, it, yeah. it's less about like, oh, okay, this isn't, this isn't possible or, and even like, whether you're on the receiving end or you're on the end that's dishing it out, like if you say something you don't mean, but you're open enough to at a later time admit that you're wrong, or at least not even admit that you're wrong, just be open to the possibility that um, grace can be afforded to other people. Like if you see that you can, have grace afforded to yourself you're not too quick to just cast somebody out and not deal with them because it's not present of mine or just like okay yeah okay now you can have my attention or now you can have my time mm -hmm. but it, it's it's nice to see the um i don't know it's like in a sense it's nice to see conversations evolve but it's also nice to observe um it it's nice to observe kind of like a reflection of yourself in the world that you yeah. live in when it's maybe when you were younger you would see something one way and you would only seek that out and you wouldn't yeah. look for the nuances but like right. as you see some nuances it's like okay like yes what was there when i was younger is still there but there's more that can be said about it. There's either a lesson that can be learned. Sure. I can just leave it alone and not bother with it. Or yeah. I can um, I can entertain it or at least listen and not be so hell bent on like, I've got to get something out of this. I've got to do something out of this. It's like, hey, the wind blows every day. And maybe it just Absolutely. goes this That's way key. and it goes that, that way. Key. That is key because when you measure, you know, you mentioned J. Cole, who was a very popular artist who, like you said before, he was definitely going in the direction of pop, hip hop, you know what I mean? And then, and I'm not saying he's not that now. I'm just simply saying he seemed like he's a lot more comfortable in his own skin. He's a lot more, um, I think authentic might be the word, but we're kind of throwing that around a little bit. But he kind of is doing things on his own terms. He's not necessarily following the the, this this role that was laid out for all other music artists. And I think that is true of a husband. 
a father, a son, an engineer, you know, a, a speaker, a coach, all these different things that we, we espouse or that we, we call ourselves. Once I have, and I can't stress this enough, Asher, once I get clarity on, oh, okay, I'm an engineer. Okay, I'm an apostle. Oh, okay, I see things foundationally. Oh, okay, I bring clarity to environments. It's easy to get typecast into that. There's a difference between who I am and what I do. There's a difference between how I show up in the world and the, what the world is comfortable seeing me do and who God has called me to be. And the void to me is to step away from a people's opinion, societal pressure, and to do, because unfortunately, here's what happens, when you've been so stifled and so limited and so stuck in what everyone expects you to do, when a person deviates from that and deviates at a, a hard right or a hard left, we call that a mental breakdown. We say the person went what? Crazy. Yeah, but they didn't go crazy. What they simply did was they were fed up and they finally had enough courage to say, you know what? I'm not all of those things, but they were. Those are aspects of who I am. So there's a difference between who I am and what I do, right? And that void that we keep talking about, embracing that void, that void is scary. That void is lonely. That void is, is fearful. That void is un it's unconventional. It's, uh, it's uncomfortable. It makes you, it, the void, right? That space or place is what people call you a failure when you're there. Mm -hmm. I bet you a lot of music executives consider J. Cole's decision to do what he did weird. Or let's think about so many different artists that we've seen who had a major hit, beautiful voice, and then all of a sudden they're off the scene. And I've been fortunate enough, as you may have been as well, to hear some of those unsung stories or where are they now stories. And they tell about how the industry just consumed everything about who they were. And I think that can happen as a husband or a father. I was telling a story just earlier today talking about how I got this thing where I don't want my wife to touch a gas pump, nor do I ever want her to wash a car. I don't want her to change any oil. I take care of all of that. And it sounds amazing, right? Mm -hmm. It's good to brag on, right? It's good to tell you on this podcast, but why am I doing it? Because I had to question myself, am I doing it, Asher, to be impressive to other people? Oh, we got to get back to that. Am mm -hmm. I doing it for you all? Or am I doing it because it is germane and important to me? Because the dopamine that I receive from you telling me I'm awesome only goes so far. Mm -hmm. But the dopamine I receive, the serotonin, the oxytocin, and the endorphins that flows through my body by aligning with the divine, by doing what God called me to do, called me to do, is far more powerful than the outside affirmations of other people. We got to be careful, bro. We got to be careful. And all of us are susceptible to it. When I see the guy who's got the, the perfect body, the perfect tan, and the perfect car, and the perfect girl, I always think to myself, that's not going to last long because it's not realistic. Mm -hmm. It costs too much effort and energy. Who's going to love you without all of that stuff? That's what I want. Yeah. My wife has this saying, she says, love the one who loves your dirty drawers. That's who the one can, can you love your own dirty drawers? And if I can divorce myself from what everyone else tells me I have to be, if I can divorce myself from the fear of the unknown, from the fear of the voice, from the, the fear of not uncertain, unclear, un, uncouth, unimaginable, if I can release myself from that and shift my perspective. It's not that I'm uncertain. It's that I'm unlimited. I can fill the blank with whatever I choose. If I realize that X is not bad, the unknown isn't what it is. It's unlimited. Then I can move from this place of the world dictating to me who I am to a place where I dictate who I am in the world. And by me being courageous enough to do it, I can free other people. And that's what's key. Right. That's what's key. That's what I love about your podcast. Can I be courageous enough to do something that is never been done before? And this is the beautiful thing, and I was going to say it earlier, the beautiful thing about something that is obscure, it is always obscure first if, before you go from obscurity to popularity. It's always obscure first. Mm -hmm. If I give you a few names, you will associate them with certain things. So if I say Starbucks, you say coffee. Why? There's not a Starbucks coffee bean, is it? No, no, it's not that. It's just a word that's associated with coffee. If I say Oval Redenbacher, what do you say? Before my time. <laughs> well, popcorn. 
right? You've probably seen the man <laughs> I, on the box. I'm, you right I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You're right I had, about that. I had you know, a very part there. <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? You I know probably, what you like, mean. You probably know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> but, 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 you know, but if I say, but if I say, if I say Nintendo, yeah. what, 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 is, what is a Nintendo? But you associate it with something in your mind. And my point is that sometimes the thing that we're looking for doesn't come from us conforming but staying true to who we are, stand on the outside, embrace the void, do what you want to do, right? Do what you, and you're going to carve out something that your family has never seen before. You're going to carve out something that your bloodline has never seen before. You're going to carve out something that your, your culture, your ethnos and your ethos have never seen before. And you're going to free up a bunch of people because now we're not limited to who we can be and how we can show up in the world. A black man is supposed to do this. Uh, a man is supposed to do that. A Christian, a, a, a preacher's kid is supposed to, I'm sorry, I bet you're so sick of that, what a preacher <laughs> kid is supposed to do and not do. And you literally probably had to be a bad kid or a deviant kid to prove to somebody who had this limited thinking of what a pastor's kid could do. So now you got to be extra uh, perverse, extra, mm -hmm. uh, you got to go out of your way to prove to people that you're not who they think you are. Again, their opinions got you. The void got you. The void stole from you an ability to be who you are, the opinions of men. And so to the listeners, to the people who, and I hope this is your number one podcast ever. I hope this is the, the number one episode ever. And I guess the message I'm trying to express to people who are listening is embrace that void. Embrace the unknown. Embrace the thing that people are telling you is wrong, not in the sense of, I'm not talking about morally, right? I'm not mm -hmm. talking about you breaking the law. I'm not talking about being illegal, immoral, or unethical, but I'm talking about breaking the rules of, well, who said that I have to do it this way? Who said that, that if a man of color, I can't ski? Who says that? Mm -hmm. Who says that if I'm a man of color, I don't swim? Who told us that? Who said that I can't excel in this area? I am not, this, F, this issue that I have copious amounts of melanin in my skin, I see you do as well. Mm -hmm. So what, I, what I'm saying is that I am not limited. I appreciate everybody that's come before me. And I appreciate all that you've given me that gives me clarity on how I can show up in the world. But the clarity you gave me is not going to be a prison. I'm not going to let you limit me. I thank you for giving me what you gave me, but I don't owe you my life. Hmm. I don't. I don't owe you my life. And I am going to embrace this void. I'm going to embrace the things that are unknown and unfamiliar to me. Why? Because if I change my perspective, if I go into the abyss, I might find out that the abyss is scarier. <laughs> it's scary only because everyone else around me is afraid. Hmm. But there's nothing to be afraid of. And my destiny is in the void. My destiny is in the abyss. My destiny is in the place that no one else is bold enough to go into. How can we show up in the world authentically? How can we show up in this world and not be limited by what people say? And I, and I appreciate the question, who do you say you are? I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a man of God. I'm a speaker. I'm a teacher. I'm a mentor. I'm a prophet of the almighty God. But that is not all that I am. I'm more than that. I'm a content creator. I'm, I'm a strategist. I'm all of these different things, a thought leader. But those things, they might inform who I am, but they don't limit who I am. Right. Ah, you got to get what I'm saying. I'm not limited. I'm unlimited. I'm unlimited. The X, bro, the X, the X means I'm unlimited. I guess as a, as a follow-up to that, it's um, realizing that you're unlimited or like having moments like these that are times of realization when you're you're excited you're passionate it's like when you realize that you're unlimited mm -hmm. you still how do you find like where to go next maybe that's the no 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 great question that's, great that's question like, because you mentioned before like needing that order that structure that that's something mm -hmm. that helps right. me to to navigate because a lot of times it it can for some people it's easy to operate in the unknown in the chaos it's like man i've got all mm -hmm. these opportunities to grab at but it's like where do i go first because if yeah. if you don't go in a direction you can quickly 
fold into yourself and be like, uh, maybe I was just, maybe I just got excited. Maybe I just got hyped and I just, I, I didn't know what I was talking about. I, I just, it's possible. I had a dopamine hit and I was just it's like, possible. yeah, it's like, no, 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 let me, let me go back to what I'm comfortable with. Let me go back to what possible. makes sense. Like, yep. how do you possible. balance that good. in? No, good question. Good question. And I don't know. Got, Mm-hmm. Yep, and I don't know if there is balance because unfortunately that is part of the problem. Part of the problem is you're trying to evaluate the unknown based on the the rules and the standards and the policies and the procedures of where you used to be. Right. Now you know, you know, you know, you know for a fact that what was beneficial for you in high school did not necessarily work for you in college. Right? Even though that was the information that was necessary. So let me let me articulate it this way. As a man of color in America, you know that we are perceived in a particular way. So there is a, an or, urban culture, right? Um, the hood, whatever you want to refer to it as. And we, um, you may speak in a particular way. So I would go to my, my mother's, uh, my grandmother's house, right? And so I'd be around my cousins and they would, they would talk about me. They would score, Joan and roast might be the term you're familiar with, but they would joke on me because of the way I spoke. I had this, um, uh, I was speaking the King's English and I was speaking fairly properly because I had gone to, I was going to a, a private school and it was predominantly Caucasian. Now, here's what's interesting. The information and the way that I was behaving in one environment was productive, but I took that same behavior to the country where my, my mother lived and all of a sudden that same behavior became a liability, mm-hmm. right? But then if I took the behavior that I had around my family, around country folk, around good old, you know, regular people, urban folk, and then took that into corporate America. And I don't have the ability to communicate. I don't have the ability to be um, forthcoming in certain behavior. I'm not trying to be critical of one or the other. I'm just simply mm-hmm. saying what is good in one environment, one behavior that is going to bless you in one environment is the exact same behavior that will limit you in a different environment. Mm-hmm. So this idea that we can that we can keep on doing what we've always done and go into this next generation, or, and I'll give it to you this way, and I, I'm hesitant to say this, but I'll say it. So we know that, that uh, okay, sure, sure, I'll do it. There, at, at one point, everyone is a slave to something, mm-hmm. right? You're a slave to a way that, that you think maybe you are addicted to something, maybe you are a slave to other people's opinion, but then you come out of that. You come to a point where you are now able to think for yourself, or you realize that this slave thing is not all that it's cut out to be. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. And now you begin to serve yourself. But then there's still another level, right? Then there's another level. Once you've served for a little while and you realize that, yeah, I am smart. I am pretty resilient. I can do some things on my own. Now you step into ownership. Ownership is son. So the, the progression in this life that we live is to go from a slave to other people's opinion, to be able to serve your own self-interest, but then to be able to start to walk in a sonship and ownership. So that's the progression, slave, servant, son, right? So I'm trying to go from a place where I was a slave to other people's opinions, a slave to the um, the environment. Hmm. Now I begin able to serve the environment and I'm able to make the environment work for me. But hmm. then there's a point where I realize that I own the environment. I own my environment hmm. because my thoughts are my thoughts. The word says that I was made in the image and the likeness of God. I'm, I'm the only thing that God created that has the ability to also create. So I have a creative power inside of me. Not to mention, I have the breath of God in me, the rock of God, which is the wind of God, R-U-A-H, R-U-A-C-H. It means the wind of God, the life of God, the spirit of God, and the breath of God. And I have that on the inside of me. So every time I, that means that there's a promise connected to that breath. And if there's a promise connected to, the, to that breath, and I know that God gives me vision and provision are, are intertwined, they're connected, then there's an also an ROI, there's a return on investment that God has, then that means that there, every time I breathe or the fact that I am breathing, the promises of God are still intact. So I don't have to be holding to anyone. I got rules I got to follow. I got stuff I've got to do. I got I to gotta answer certain calls as a husband, a father, and a man. But I'm also unlimited in the sense of how I can show up in this world and to find those ways and to find that you talked about balance. What's the first step? The first step to answer your question succinctly is to recognize that my thoughts are not my own. I am living somebody else's dream. How much of someone else's influence are you 
when, whether whatever the conversation is, whether the conversation is about raising children, whether the conversation is about homosexuality, whether the conversation is whether or not you believe in God, all these hot topics that are hot in the world today. I'm not picking on anybody, but these are hot topics. Mm -hmm. Whether you are uh, conservative or, or, or a liberal, all of these questions, have you really evaluated those for yourself or have you adopted the belief systems of the people around you? Until you evaluate that, do you actually believe what you're saying and doing? You might not even believe in marriage. Then why are you married? Because everyone else told you that you had to get married. I'm saying I want you to question everything. Question. Now, maybe you come to the conclusion that I do agree and I do believe there's a God. Mm -hmm. I do believe that this is the way I should raise my children. If you come to that conclusion on your own, now you're, now you're working with something, right? So the first step is to come to the point where you own your own thoughts, right? your but own that, belief systems. And that's a that's a big first step because when you say you've really got to question it, as big or as small as a question as it, it is that you can start with, it, when it's asking, do you actually believe this? And going into the researcher, asking also the question in a way that you're, you're, you're willing to um, entertain what the, like that internal response yeah. to your question would be, because it's, I, I feel like I've, I've been trying to do this over the last two to four years. And what I'm finding is that the more I really take time to sit down and ask the question and not, and try not to just go with what's convenient, because as That's you're it. asking the question, say i spend 10 minutes i spend an hour on it i spend a week a day it's in in a way i feel that i can torment myself but yes. it's like if yes. you if i really want to know what i believe on this without just taking an easy out or having a, su mm -hmm. a succinct argument that's clear enough like this is good enough like let me get the cliff notes it sounds good it's like it, it'll it'll work for a minute but then when i come up against another piece of opposition it's like uh, i didn't really answer that question and then it keeps coming up again but then let me ask you this question we say that mm -hmm. but we don't say it in the gym no you don't go to the gym and say man i just mastered the 20 pound and this 30 pound is in here. I don't want to go to, we will never say I'm never coming to the gym again because now I've gone up to the 30 pound it, and we understand it. In certain, and I'm almost literally, let me slow down and make sure I'm clear on what I say. Mm -hmm. We understand it in other areas. I, I don't drink, but let's assume I was a drinker. Mm -hmm. I know you start off with beer or, or wine and, you, and then progressively you drink more and more and more. But a mm -hmm. person who doesn't drink a lot, this is what I do know, and they, they go on a, on a binge and drink a lot, they're going to have a bad day. Mm -hmm. But a person who's been drinking for years, and I know there's a difference between beer and wine and, and dark liquor. So mm -hmm. the person that drinks a beer every once in a while is not the same person who drinks a wine every once in a while. Those mm -hmm. are two different people. People who drink vodka or bourbon, those are two different drinkers, right? And so... But they didn't necessarily start off that way. They built up to that. And I'm saying, I'm saying we understand it in other arenas of life. Why can't we apply it here? Um, as an engineer, there was a part where you were a beginner, then you had to become a, um, I forget the term, um, in, in the middle, not intermediate, but uh, it's, uh, it's not a junior. But, but you work your way up. You're not a master engineer from day one, right? right. You're not seen as such, right? So there's an apprenticeship to it. Right. right. Or at least in some ways, they're like, well, how long have you been at it? They expect something out of you after a couple of years that they don't expect out of you. Once you've been doing it for 10 years, mm -hmm. there's a level of mastery that is assumed or presumed to be connected to what you do. And so we understand it in every other aspect of life. But when it comes to uh, personal development or when it comes to achieving things that are that are personal to us, we all of a sudden forget. And it's the same. Well, you got to go through the process. Yes, sir. I'm listening. That, no, that's true. And and I think when uh, something I, I, I want to say is that 
multiple things go hand in hand and sometimes maybe it might be to a detriment but sometimes like when one thing isn't working out i start to question what is it really that i understand about this because if you're talking about something that's schooling like right. something that you do every single day it becomes a habit it becomes a part of your nature it becomes a part of who you are so say if you're an athlete like you're you're starting you're going through little league you're going through the next the, and the next phase and the next phase part of it could be okay this is what i do and then if you don't manage that well you develop a sense of fatigue or maybe you're, what do you mean you, get, by you don't manage it well what do you mean like you if mean? if you're if you're um a lot of athletes get burnt out like mm, they okay. they lose love for the game or they like there's certain expectations like if you're a fighter for instance because we we've spoken on mma before and like you see people that start out and a part of the stage that they're on is that you've got to be able to perform you go right. in and you work out you lift the weights you um do things to build your confidence up like there's weight lifting there's um skills training the similar thing for like engineering it's like you're going through school you're you've you're taught certain things and it's like you take a test you get to a level you you take multiple tests to get a certification that gets you a job that gets you somewhere and it's that so long as you keep in your mind this is the goal like if you're going for a fight like the end goal is that you're going to go in there with somebody else and at the end of it you win or lose like if you win right. people talk about you you're relevant um like if you're winning at work if you're winning in your home life it's like okay you're employed you're hired you're getting along with the people in your circle like things that you say have some weight some value you feel like mm -hmm. you're you're contributing you're building yourself up but in the external Right. Those, external. Those, those are external. And then what I'm saying is when, if you don't manage it well, like if you focus more on the external mm -hmm. and you don't build anything up internally, the moment that something shifts externally, right. say you lose, um, someone right. asks you a question about something you don't necessarily know. You maybe think yeah. because I've put in all this time, I'm expected to know, like maybe nobody right. told you you had to know this, but because in, in your mind you've built up like, okay, it went from this level to this level to this level. It's like, yeah, you might have built up those levels or you might have put in all that time, but losing failure or just not hitting the mark can happen to anyone. But you're okay or your confidence doesn't take that big of a hit if you recognize either in the moment or soon after whatever happens that, okay, this didn't work out or, Hey, I don't know this, but it's okay for me to acknowledge that I don't know it. I can right. ask a question and I can go seek it out. Now that I, I don't know it, it's going to take. Losing, losing mm -hmm. according to whom though is, is what I'm really asking. It's, it's losing according to either what's the standard that's been set or what you what you by believe yourself in, or right. by the environment because i'm trying to really make sure i'm clear on something with you right. if those standards are for the environment then here's what i'm asking the question is my purpose my mm -hmm. gift my call and if i've come to a place and i'm starting to lose right. or the output is less productive is that because i'm experiencing fatigue or has my season in that environment come to a close? That's one idea. Then the right. other idea is, why, why did I become an MMA fighter? Why did I become an engineer? If I became an engineer because my, my African parents demanded that I could only be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer, if I became those for those reasons, then I didn't do it because of something that was internally motivating for me. Mm -hmm. And again, we are still being limited by the ethnos and the ethos. Right. I'm saying there's so many different societal pressures. And I'm not saying that we're not susceptible to it. Please understand something. Right. I'm not telling you that you have it and I have it. And I'm still, I'm going to walk out of this room right now and I'm going to be hit with some societal pressures. 
right? I have an expectation as a husband and as a father mm -hmm. right now. And mm -hmm. I got to measure those up. But at the same time, I cannot value myself or I cannot determine my personal value from the expectations or the indication or the dictations of other people. And right. as long as I allow other people to dictate how I feel about me, mm -hmm. I did miss the mark according to you. Right. I miss your mark, but I right. didn't miss my mark. And we're going to have to mitigate and negotiate. And I just, you're going to have to hold me, you know, hold me harmless. I'm going to be, a, mm -hmm. I'm going to dignify myself in the sense that I'm no longer going to be beholden to other people's limitation of who I can show up and not show up in this world. Right. Because I have a, I have an opinion of mm -hmm. myself that is no longer in alignment with your opinion of me. And that mm -hmm. doesn't make me a bad person. Right. It doesn't make me a bad man. It just makes me unique. And that is a part of the void we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. The void is you won't be everybody's favorite cup of tea. And that's something you got to be okay. Because at the root of what we're talking about, and I hope people have waited long enough to hear what I'm about to say, at the root and at the core, what we're talking about is we are making decisions for our lives based on the fact that we don't want to experience the spirit of rejection. Mm -hmm. I'm doing, I am complying with what you say. I'm, I'm, I'm literally allowing you to dictate my life because I don't want you to shun me. I don't want you to walk away from me and I don't want you to reject me. But what I'm saying is that that rejection is the void of, of appreciate the void. Why? Because if I'm only your friend, if I'm only your husband, if I'm only your father on your terms, then we don't have a relationship. We don't have a, a symbiotic relationship. What we have is a parasitic relationship. And to your point, if we don't have a symbiotic relationship, if you are just a parasite only sucking my blood, if my cup is empty every time I deal with you, then eventually it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. At some point in the future, you're going to drain me for all that I have because you're not pouring back into me. Mm -hmm. And I have to love myself enough to say that, you know what, this relationship no longer, this environment no longer is serving me. And it could be because my season is over. It could be because I never was supposed to be in this environment to begin with. Because I, I became an MMA fighter, I'm speaking hypothetically, because I was bullied as a kid and I didn't ever want to be bullied anymore. And I wanted to be tough in the world. Mm -hmm. So I became an MMA fighter so that nobody would mess with me. And I didn't do it because of the affirmations. I did it because of fear. And it goes back to what you said before. Am I chasing something or am I running away from something? And we can't tell because a lot of times we see people running and they're in hot pursuit of something. And it looks like they are chasing after their dreams. But I bet you if you ask a few questions, if you pay enough attention, you'll find out they're actually running from something. Yeah. They're running from that five-year-old little boy I was telling you about earlier. Why do you do what you do? Why are you trying to be a good husband and a good father? Because you didn't have it growing up and you want to be better than your father before. That can only last for so long. That, mm -hmm. that external motivator can only be powerful enough for me for so long. At some point, I, those core values have to be something I've embraced. It has to be something that is important to me. I can't simply be operating from a place of I'm going to show my father I'm better than him. That can, own that, that can only fuel you for so long, mm -hmm. right? Or even to do what your parents want you to do. And I'm, please understand something. I'm telling, hey, take it, take it for what it's worth. I'm not telling you to disobey your parents. I'm not telling you not to go to college and your parents want you to go to school. What I'm saying is that there's a point where if you're not hardwired to be whatever you are being forced to be by the culture, by the society, by the, by the religion, by the family, by whatever, at some point, there's going to be a breakdown. So what I'm saying is, and that's what we saw. We saw it very popular. We can speak about it now, but we've seen it all over. There's so many different people who have hit this level of success in our culture. They have all of the external uh, trappings of success, the money, the popularity, the wealth. Heck, they're even good looking, but then they're breaking down publicly. They're committing suicide. And I can give you a list of five people who have taken their lives, who you and I both thought going up to into the conversation, we thought that they were the pillar of success. And we find out once you pull back those layers that they were depressed. When you pull back those layers, we find out that they filled the void with stuff, but the void was never filled. Come on, man. Right. Ah, and 
And I've learned that there is a God-sized void in the heart of every human being. Because I heard him say it this way. You know Miles Monroe. He says this. He says, when you don't know the purpose of a thing, the abuse is inevitable. And I think that is true of a wife. I think that is true of a life. And I, saw, I also think that's true of strife. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know the purpose of why you are experiencing chaos right now, you're going to abuse that. You think yeah. they're attacking you. No, the fact that you are being attacked is to create an awareness in you that there is still an offense monster on the inside of you. Mm -hmm. There's still an anger monster on the inside of you. You still have some trauma triggers on the inside of you. And if I push the right amount of buttons in you at the right amount of time, if I can cause you to feel a certain way at a certain moment, I will cause you to act a plumb fool in front of the world if necessary. Yeah. That's not a man that's in control. That's a man out of control, right? And so we got to take our time. If we don't know the purpose of a thing, the abuse is inevitable, whether it be a wife, a life, or strife. We got to take our time to understand, okay, what is the purpose of this life that I've been given? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed, the culture says I'm supposed to be popular. I'm supposed to be successful. And the, and the success, success is only driven by three things. The amount of money I have, the amount of popularity I have, and the amount of possessions I have. But if none of those things, if you are not a person driven by money, then how is that going to make you happy ultimately? Right. If you're, if you're transactional, that's about money. But if you're transformational, that's about the intents of the heart. Mm -hmm. Who cares? And, I, and I've met a few. I've met a few millionaires about people who own their own private planes. And in dealing with a lot of them, I'm watching and I'm paying attention and I'm looking at their lives. I had a limousine business 20 years ago. And I'm at these private airports and I'm going to these private jets and I'm watching the moves. I'm watching who's around them. And I, and I realized two very powerful things. I realized, number one, everybody around them was on payroll. Mm -hmm. Now, you tell me. If you are making good money with someone and they ask you a hard question and the question could offend them and that can always happen. And that offense, because we know how it happens, if mm -hmm. the offense is deep enough, you might lose your job. Which one are you going to choose? Are you going to choose that hard, unadulterated truth or are you going to say something that's going to stroke the ego? Nobody around them could tell them that unfiltered, unadulterated truth. Why? Because they all were banking on keeping things as they were. Right. So they literally had nobody around them that could hold them accountable. Nobody. Then I saw who they were dating. And I'm like, and, and even when it comes to their relationships, everybody was paid for. Hmm. Sometimes it was an actual transaction. Maybe they would call girls. Forgive me for your listeners. I'm not trying to get raunchy on the um, on the uh, podcast. But in some cases, it was a long-term transaction. Mm -hmm. She was around, but she wasn't dating no broke guys. And he wasn't a guy without the money who could actually date a woman as beautiful as she was. So there was an exchange. Mm -hmm. His success, his, his billions, and her beauty. And that is a... That is a recipe for danger because she's not always going to be beautiful and you might not always have the money. Mm -hmm. So that is a super. So I, I realized that the wider the success in this world got and the higher the success got, the more shallow and the more fragile it became. Mm -hmm. Is that what we're chasing? I, I would see that and I thought to myself, what? Is that the rat race everybody is on to get to the point where they are such a a powerful and a distinctive entrepreneur that they have their own planes, trains, and automobiles. And the benefit of it is you get to date your daughter or your grand, a woman the age of your daughter or a woman the age of your granddaughter. That's the extent mm -hmm. of the success. No, thank you. And so that lets me know that the system was twisted. And I'm so happy God gave me a glimpse of that early on. I met entertainers, I met celebrities, I met all these different people, and they were not happy. In fact, the success that they had, the money, the popularity, and the fame actually created a border around them. It created a hedge around them. Now, some people would say a hedge of protection, but I would say that the hedge around them was a prison. Hmm. They were locked in. They didn't have the freedom to be who they were. They were locked into a, a way of speaking. You were talking about J. Cole earlier. Yeah. They were locked into being only one version of themselves. 
And it's the version that the outside, the ethnos and the ethos had told them was good. And they had got to this plateau of finance, this plateau of popularity, this, 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 um, this plateau of possessions, but yet they weren't happy, right? And so the beautiful thing is this, the success that we see, the fulfillment, which is the real word, because I really don't care for the word success. Success mm -hmm. can mean anything, but the fulfillment that we seek, money won't buy. Money won't buy. And we got to come to a point, we got to come to a point where we embrace the void and we embrace the unknown because you asked a very powerful question earlier. Am I more afraid of failure or am I more afraid of success? And my answer is yes. <laughs> my answer is yes. Yeah. We are afraid of both. We are afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. We're afraid to be embarrassed, but we are also afraid to step into the thing that God has called us to be. Right. We are afraid. And yeah. I mean, to, to follow up on what you just said there, being afraid of the, the failure and the success is that, um, and I guess it, I wouldn't say maybe in some circles, like, a lot of the decisions we have, whether they're moral or like personal decisions, like when you point to the example with people being on payroll for someone that's well, well to do, it's whether you're in that position or whether you're trying to just look out for yourself as a young up and comer, it's the decisions you make have consequences but yes. depending on what what the decision is whether you're you're trying to really find out who you are and what you believe right that may have more of a consequence on yourself and yes you might get shunned for a bit but thankfully in the environment that we live it's not like if you get kicked off of social media for instance, you may lose some friends, but the more you get to know yourself and you really put time in to understand what you think and why you think what you think, you might be better off meeting someone that's your neighbor and understanding like, okay, here are things I didn't know about my neighbor that I know now. Like here's something that I value that's not just, okay, mm -hmm. I can trust you because you're a family man, you're, um, you take care of your children, you take care of your wife, you don't abuse them. It's like those things matter. It's not just, uh, okay, did you, um, did you signal to me socially that everything's good? It's like, it can get extreme on, on the one hand where it's just like you're constantly having to announce and profess what it is that you're doing, but on the other hand is that if you're really honest and true to the people closest to you, but more importantly to yourself, people can see that without you, necessar you necessarily having to announce it. And I guess I'm, something I'm- yes, to, but why go, did you have to announce it? And I'm-, and I'm Well, really I mean, I wanna make sure before- You gotta divorce yourself from that. And I'm right, right. That we're talking about a general you, but you gotta divorce yourself from that. And I'm not saying that it's easy. Right. I'm saying it's difficult. I'm saying you don't owe anybody anything. Honestly. Right. But I mean, it's um, I understand that now, but mm -hmm. without like before, when you're you're trying to understand something, and you you when you're mimicking, like when I'm mimicking right. my environment, if I'm seeing right. Okay, that's someone that's well respected, someone that's um, like yourself, someone that's artic, someone that presents something in a way that I can understand. Mm -hmm. If I see them carry themselves in a way based on what I'm seeing, that's what I'm trying to follow, whether it's mm -hmm. right or wrong. But you inspire me, though. I appreciate you saying that, but you inspire me through your consistency. Mm -hmm. And so if you hadn't have done what you decided to do and you had to step out and be bold, mm -hmm. then there are people and, and they're far and wide. They may never text you. You may never hear from them, but they are in prayer. They saw some, like, wait a minute, I've seen, I've seen this podcast 
mm-hmm. it's my time podcast pop up a number of and it might just be something that they saw in the peripheral but it was co- the consistency mm-hmm. and i'm now getting that right i'm now getting to the point where people are they're like man your consistency wow, i didn't know you knew this and and man so and so you're behind the scenes on that and it's like all of this stuff if i was you i would do this i'm like yeah but mm-hmm. you know what i mean Right. You know what I mean? And and it's a weird thing because I'll be honest with you, I was in a place financially with the um, carpet cleaning business. I mean, I did a strong six figures with the carpet cleaning business. I don't make that now. Yeah. I don't make that now. But as as far as the work I do, um, speaking, mentoring, and coaching, the, the work that I do with men, I am more fulfilled spiritually than I am financially. Mm-hmm. But when I was making all that money, I was more fulfilled financially but my spirit was void. Mm. What do you value? Right. What do you value? And so I value the spirit realm more importantly. And I also believe the scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all is righteousness. And then all of these things will be added to you. And right. so again, again, it's like, what do you value? Who, who makes you feel the way you feel? And, and I guess if I'm and, and I want to be very clear about this point. You got to come to the point where you own your void. Even mm-hmm. if that void is someone saying, you should have did this, you should have did this, and you should have did that. Because I had to evaluate this as a, as a parent. Mm-hmm. I started to evaluate, why do I want my daughter to do certain things? And once I investigated it, Asher, I realized that I wanted her to do certain things because it made me look good. Right. Not because it was important to who she was. I was grinding for her last name, not her first name. And so my question is this, as we talk about ourselves, am I doing what I'm doing to appease people who really matter to me? If it's your, if it's your wife, I get that. That's a covenant. If right. it's your children, that's different. That's different. Because, the, because your children are eventually going to leave you. Right. So... At 18 years old, 21 years old, however old, they're going to leave your home. You got to make sure you're doing things to protect your heart, right? And again, I know we hear it oftentimes. uh, We hear the thing about, well, if the plane ever drops the the masks, the the natural reaction to a caregiver is to put the mask on the person that you love. Mm. But the instructions are the exact opposite. It says, put the mask on first. Right. So for years, I was an EMT, and one of the things we learned about scene safety, if we were to go to a GSW gunshot wound, we were to go to a, a tornado scene, if we were to go to a mass casualty incident, the first thing they taught us is scene safety. Do not become a victim of the incident in which you've been assigned to save. Mm-hmm. So you got to be mindful of the environment. Don't you become, don't you become, uh, if there's still an active shooter, don't you get shot. Because mm-hmm. now, instead of you being a helper, you've doubled down. Now the helper is hurt. Right. And so we got to go into these environments and we got to first make sure the scene is safe for us to be able to conduct whatever we got to conduct. And then mm-hmm. after you find out that the scene is safe, when you are looking at a life, and we'll just consider that to be a dream, we went through your ABCs. Mm-hmm. Airway, breathing, circulation, ABCs. You made sure that the airway was not obstructed, right? You made sure that you had breath sounds. You put your ear up to the mouth. And then after you did those things, then if you felt no pulse, then you started chest compressions, Mm -hmm. CPR, right? So first, make sure there's nothing in the mouth. Second, make sure they're breathing on their own. And third, start giving CPR. So what am I saying? Your, your dream, your life, you're the life that I'm referring to. You got to make sure that the scene is safe. So the first thing is I want you to make sure that you're not being obstructed. We talked about your breath, right? Mm-hmm. That's the life of God, the wind of God, the breath of God, and the spirit of God. Make sure that you're not letting the world obstruct your own breath. Mm-hmm. You're not letting the environment stifle a life that God gave to you. You've given the, the power and dominion over your life to other people and their opinion. They don't matter, right? Second one, make sure you're breathing. Make sure you are taking taking full advantage of the full capacity of the lungs that you have. So God is giving you breath. So breathe it all in. It's the wind of God, the breath of God the life of God and the spirit of God. And it's all of you. Explore everything. 
that belongs to you, all of it. And then last but not least, if you find yourself, and it could happen, you find yourself, you don't have the circulation, the blood is not pumping, the oxygen is not getting to the fingers and the toes. If you express, now it's time for some intervention. Now it's time for some CPR. What do you do to recharge your batteries? Where do you run when you are in a situation where you don't feel good about yourself? What do you do? Do you run to, to alcohol, alcohol and drugs? And say, do you run to that relationship that you shouldn't be in? Or do you have some productive means by which to build yourself back up? Where do you get your culinary, what is it, CPR, culinary, what is it, cardiac pulmonary resuscitation? How do you resuscitate yourself, mm. man? And ain't nobody going to do it for you. You got to do it on your own. So right. stop. My, my question is, please stop giving permission to other people. Please stop giving permission to other environments. Please stop giving permission. We are literally, are you grinding for your first name, which is who you are, mm -hmm. or are you grinding for your last name, which is who people expect you to be, right? Yeah. Man, that should be it, bro. Yeah. <laughs> that should I, be it, bro, man. <laughs> Well, I, just want, I, I wanted to maybe end on this. And I, I think okay. with what you said and trying to pick up on one of the questions you asked when you when you asked, like, where's that validation coming from? Like looking externally when you should be looking internally. And I, I think mm -hmm. one we well, talked about. Yeah. Well, it's the process, right? Mm -hmm. It starts off external. Right. That's the, that's the only place it can be because you don't know what you have in you. But there's a point where the external can only take you so far. And now you have to look internal. Right. And because there is a clarity that you get from the outside world. There is right. there is a power in what your parents have to say with your ethnicity, the ethnos. There's there's a power in the ethos. Mm -hmm. But my concern is once we get to the point where we, when you start to realize who you are. Why are you here? Mm -hmm. and what you're supposed to be doing, those same environments that gave you so much clarity can now become constricting. Right. That's the danger. Right. And so we got to be careful when we know, it's no differently than the, than, the, um, than the butterfly in the cocoon. There's a point where the butterfly has to emerge from the cocoon or he will die. Right. There's, a, there's a point where the baby has to emerge from the, the mother's stomach. Right. But and so I we understand those different phases, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and I think what's really key speaking on the butterfly in the cocoon is that um, to answer what is it that you're answering to or what is it that you're listening to is that specifically what I found for myself is that when I'm I'm going internally and I'm asking the question, I'm doing the thing that feeds me. I do get the wandering eye to say okay, I'm doing this for myself, but what does this significant person in my life think? Like, okay. Stop asking for permission. Right, right. So it's I mean, I one, can't stress that enough. One, yeah, there's, the stop, there's the stop asking, but it's in doing the internal work, I'm, I'm, I'm reminding myself to stop questioning what it is that I'm doing and to stop second guessing what it is that I'm doing because it's that, in taking the time away to do what I need to do and make it clear to those around me that this is what I'm doing. It doesn't need to be announced every single day, but if I'm taking the yeah. time to answer yeah, the question, yeah. I'm yeah. answering that question and I'm living out the response to that. The moment that I start going backward and I start looking back at what was validating before what was the status i'm slowly undoing the progress that i'm already making and right. it's that it's up it's that it's really the while you're operating in the unknown is is what i'm getting at it's like when you're operating in the unknown in the unlimited it's it's empowering but Again, looking at your perspective, it can be if if you take your eyes off from, okay, I'm working in, in the unlimited, I'm looking at what I can become. I don't know what it is and I don't need to know. That's a big thing. You don't need to know it right now. What you can become who you are might be 
talked about thousands of years after, or it might not be talked about, but the thing is being comfortable in the now, being comfortable in what now might produce, but right. not being so consumed with what I'm doing right now has to get something that has to get something that has to be get something. And it's right. that- You'll never know if it's a real seed. If it's a right. true seed, you'll never know. Well, I shouldn't say you never know. It might take years to know. Right, um, right. There are there are skills that I'm using now that were developed 30 years ago, mm. and I they were they've been sitting on the shelf and I didn't know what they were. Um, right. I didn't know why I was an EMT. I didn't know I went from store management, uh, I went from ownership, and now I was an EMT and I wasn't making a lot of money as an EMT. But mm. now I understand why because now I understand triage. Mm. Now I understand scene safety. Now I understand the ABCs. Now I understand that literally in the spirit realm, I am. I am an EMT spiritually. I help people resuscitate dreams, hopes, desires, and passions. And I didn't understand it, but I had to go through that, had to be in the medical field to understand what it was. And there's a difference, huge difference between what happens at a hospital and what happens uh, for a first responder. Very different environment. And here's a beautiful thing that I learned. First responders are not reviewed as medical personnel, even though they are the first point of contact in the system, but they are not regarded as such. They are looked down upon, right? And so when you are helping people, like I help now, there's not going to be a lot of clapping or celebratory moments for you. You're not going to get a lot of flowers, but the work is hard, the work is deep, and the work is important, Am I, and you don't get paid a lot for it. Am I willing to do the work? And the reward is I am operating where I'm supposed to be. So now, instead of me having these external, and I'm, I'm, I'm living it, brother, I'm living it. I now no longer have, I have no, I can't look to the paycheck. I can't look for the affirmation. I can't, you know, put on, okay, I'm a $100,000 a year entrepreneur. I can't look to my Yelp rating. I don't have any of that stuff anymore. But when I tell you I'm more fulfilled than I've ever been before by standing in the place that God has called me to, I now look to the heels from which my help comes from. Hmm. I stopped looking at other people and I started looking at myself. I started looking at God and I'm right where I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm doing it on a high level. And I have to be comfortable with that. If I look at, because I got friends, they're still doing big things, right? They're still, mm -hmm. they got the big cars and the big houses and their homes and cars are a lot nicer than mine, but they don't have the peace I have either. Mm -hmm. They don't have the peace. They don't have the sense of fulfillment that I have. So what do you want? Because what you really want at the core of human existence, what you really want, money won't buy. The opinions of other people won't buy. What you want at the end of the day is a fulfillment in yourself. And you'll never get a fulfillment giving the power to other people, brother. You'll never get it. Mm -hmm. It'll never happen until, see, the word of God says this, man. And I'm, and I'm adamant about scripture, not because I'm this big Bible head. I'm adamant about scripture because it is the one thing over time that has stood the test of time. Right, All these other new ideas, if you think about all the modern ideas, and no disrespect to any of them, those ideas are less than 50 years old. We don't know if those ideas, right, the, the, the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset, the, the five second rule, the, the thinking grow rich, all of that stuff is less than 100 years old. We don't know if it's going to stand the test of time. So what I'm going to do is instead of me looking at Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is probably an awesome book, I've read it. Or, or Think and Grow Rich, I'm going to go to Solomon because Solomon wrote his book thousands of years ago. So I'm mm -hmm. going to tap into the thousand year wisdom versus the hundred year wisdom. I'll point it simple. Mm -hmm. until, I get to the, until I get to the place where I give myself permission, where I'm comfortable. And every day is a challenge. Every day is a challenge, man. I got to I used to really like to dress, really be sharp. You know, I, I used to like, and I still, I miss it sometimes. I miss it. But for what I do right now, that is not, and again, that EMT thing really helped me do this. Being an EMT, you had to wear the right clothes. You know, I got on pants right now that I that I started to wear from the, EM, the EMT world. This Even this type of shirt, it had to be wrinkle-free shirts, something you could throw on really quick and be mobilized super fast. So I, I've learned to embrace those things because I now realize that what I'm called to do and the environment in which I'm called to do might be contradictory. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Am I willing to do what I'm supposed to do even when it's not popular? Am I willing to show up every single day, even when I know that there are people who are going to be there who are not on my side? Am I willing to say what I'm supposed to say, even if it won't be popular? Maybe you get one or two likes. Am I still willing to do and say what I'm supposed to say? And my answer today, 2022, is yes. The answer is yes. And it is a freedom. I'm, I'm liberated. I'm free from the opinion of men. And it is a freedom that is so powerful. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I, I'm okay with never going back to $100,000 a year in that business. Because what I had in that business, I had, I don't know how my marriage survived. I'm still dealing with challenges now with my children that stem from me doing what I got to do. I'm grinding for my family. That's the lie I told myself. Yeah. That's the lie I told myself. But I wasn't grinding for my family. I wasn't grinding for my wife. You know what I was doing? I was doing that for me. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't even chasing success. No, I was running from failure. Yeah, I was running from failure. I was running from you're, you're, you're 30 years old, you're 40 years old. What do you have to show in this world for being on this earth for 40 years? And I wanted to point to that business. So the business was a trophy for me. The business was a mistress for me. The business was the thing that I was using to justify my existence on this earth. And what I realized is that the business was a lie. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. That's it, bro. That's it. That's bro. it. I love you, man. I love you too. Thank you. Peace, bro.